explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Very warm welcome to the show. Good afternoon to you. I'm Vanessa Feltz. This is what's coming up. The words that she used are not words that I myself would have used. Suella Braverman on the brink. Senior Tories refuse to support the Home Secretary's scathing attack on the Met Police as the Prime Minister considers how to respond. Is her future hanging in the balance? Plus, the supermarket chain dubbed the Northern Waitrose becomes the first in the UK to put staff back on their checkouts after axing almost all its self-service tills. And... My has all been a bit mad recently. Just a week to go until the latest season of The Crown hits our TV screens, we'll be speaking to one of the only journalists in the country who's had a sneak peek. Give me a ring on 0344 499 1000, email Vanessa Feltz at talk.tv, tweet me at talk.tv, or find me on Instagram at Vanessa Feltz Official. Coming up, are Suella Braverman's days as Home Secretary numbered? First of all, though, let's have the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Vanessa. Good afternoon. London's Met Police have confirmed more than 2,000 officers will be deployed to police this weekend's Armistice and Remembrance Day events. It comes as a political row has erupted over comments made by the Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, who slated the police for allowing pro-Palestinian demos to go ahead this weekend. There have been calls for the Prime Minister to sack her, but Paul Harris, the editor of the Jewish Telegraph, has told Talk TV, Suella is in the right. I would hate to imagine this is so, but uh, I can't disagree with some of what Suella Bravman has been saying. And I think the Jewish community is delighted to have a Home Secretary of this strength behind it, uh, somebody who's unwavering in her support for the community, is right to protest or to, to hold vigils on behalf of Israel and protest about what they're seeing. Meanwhile, counter-terror police are investigating a deep fake video of London's mayor about Remembrance Sunday. Artificial intelligence has been used to create the video falsely claiming Remembrance Sunday should be moved to make room for pro-Palestinian marches. The mayor's office say it's being circulated by far-right groups. And in the last hour, police have told Talk TV that the video is being assessed by specialist officers. Well, there have been reports of intense clashes and open fire at Al Shifa Hospital in Gaza. Thousands of people are fleeing following explosions nearby as Israeli soldiers continue moving in. This comes despite Israel agreeing to a daily four hour pause to allow people to escape. A judge has ruled that Prince Harry's high court claim against the publisher of the Daily Mail can continue. The newspaper's lawyers failed to get the case thrown out of court this morning. The Duke of Sussex has accused the tabloid of gathering information illegally, while Associated Newspapers deny the allegation. The former NatWest boss, Dame Alison Rose, will miss out on around £7.6 million in pension payouts after she was forced to quit over the debanking row with Nigel Farage. The banking giant says she's not been considered a good lever, but she will still receive over £3 million worth of pay and former bonus shares. Tom Slater, the editor of Spiked Online, has told Talk TV this decision affects everyone. But the thing that concerns me, and I think the reason this has been an issue that's hit home with so many people, is that there are clearly going to be so many cases of people who are being debanked, who do not have their own television show, who do not have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Twitter followers who aren't going to be able to make as much of a fuss about this. 
And surgeons in the US have performed the first ever whole eye transplant in a human. Aaron James, who survived a high voltage electrical accident, underwent 21 hours of surgery that replaced half of his face. And although he hasn't regained sight in the new eye yet, doctors say it's shown important signs of health in blood vessels and the retina. Well, that's the latest. Now let's look at today's weather with Isabel Lang. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello again. It's not particularly warm outside, but at least it is mostly fine. Uh, so not too bad an end to the week. But my word, it started off wet this morning across the south with gusts of 60 miles an hour for parts of Devon and Cornwall. Some really heavy, thundery rain too. But that's now slid away to the southeast and a few showers will be draped around northern coast, but otherwise plenty of sunshine inland to end the day, so not too bad through the afternoon and evening. Although, as I said, not particularly warm with temperatures of, say, 6 to 10 degrees. Now, as we head through this evening, yes, quite fresh out there in the northerly breeze. Still a fair few showers as well. Quite a cluster running down through Wales into the northwest Midlands, also across northern Scotland. But I think probably from about midnight onwards, they will tend to fade. And for many, it'll be dry tonight. Some patchy clouds still, but uh, I think there will be clear enough weather to allow temperatures to dip to about two to four degrees in the countryside. So that really does mean quite a chilly start to Saturday. But a lot of sunshine on offer tomorrow, a really decent day to get out and about and enjoy the autumn colours. Fine with sunny skies, just the odd shower near the North Sea coast. Later on, though, cloud will tend to come into the south. Temperatures highest in the southwest. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Zora and Isabel. Let's move straight to our top story. The Home Secretary's future is hanging in the balance as the Prime Minister considers how to respond to her article accusing police of double standards over pro-Palestine protests. Sola Braverman said Met officers play favourites towards left-wing activists in a scathing piece in The Times yesterday which was not cleared by her bosses at number 10. It's the latest in a string of controversial comments from Braverman sparking frustration among Conservative MPs and triggering calls for her to get the sack. Senior cabinet ministers have been distancing themselves from her opinions, including the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt. Well, as many other cabinet ministers have said, uh, the words that she used are not words that I myself would have used. But I have a productive relationship with her as a colleague, and I've always given her the money that she needs uh, to fund the police, bring down crime, and to fund the immigration and asylum system. Would you get away with doing what she's done? Well, the Prime Minister has said that he has full confidence in her and I have nothing further to add. Joining me in the studio now, Gary Mon from the National Jewish Assembly. Hello, Gary. Nick Maynard, a consultant surgeon who's been visiting Gaza for 15 years. Nick will be attending a vigil tonight outside Downing Street for colleagues in Gaza. Thank you for coming. And we're also joined by Hugo Rickin, economist at The Times. Um, let's start with Hugo because he's the professional journalist amongst, amongst us. Um, Hugo, this is a puzzling, if not baffling, situation, isn't it? What is going on? We're informed by so many insiders at Downing Street that Suella is for the chop, only not quite yet, it seems. What a strange situation. So she wrote this article uh, effectively calling on the police to crack down on, on the march. Uh, she did submit it to Downing Street beforehand, but they recommended this. They told her to change it, and then she didn't do so. So it's not signed off by Downing Street, but she published it anyway. You've got a large chunk of the cabinet saying that she shouldn't have said it. And yet you've also got the prime minister saying he has full confidence in her. It seems like a dreadful mess. It also seems like she's um, uh, she's guilty of stirring stuff up and not necessarily you know, taking responsibility for, for, the, for the impact her words could have. She has the power to tell the police to ban a march, uh, but she wants the police to ask her, to ask her, to ask them to ban the march. It's a terrible mess. I and mean, one of the things we don't understand is whether she is deliberately doing this because she's angling for a sacking, because she wants to distance herself from Rishi Sunak, because then it all becomes quite difficult to work out. Because what? Because she wants to be 
leader of the opposition in the future? That seems rather strange. And also, why is Rishi Sunak making a point of saying, uh, you know, she has my endorsement or whatever it is he said, while at the same time people are suggesting, contemplating giving her the axe or the big elbow as quickly as possible. Why, what is all this duplicity and obfuscation about, would you say? I know you're only theorising here, but what do you reckon is going on? Well, as someone once said when asked to explain the behaviour of Margaret Thatcher, I don't know why she does it, I'm not a doctor. Um, <laughs> Suella Braverman, she, she, she causes these fights Always. A lot of people think that she says the things the government thinks, but sort of doesn't quite want to say. You know, so you've got this phenomenon of people going on on the TV and the radio in the morning, ministers going on who are basically the minister for apologising for Suella Braverman. This time, though, she does seem to have really said something that the government didn't want her to say. I can't see how it's in her interest to get sacked. I can't see that she really feels that she could be... Uh, uh, I mean, she, she, she's never had much success in the past when running for the leadership of the Conservative Party. Maybe she does feel she has an option to do so. I think I think the, the sort of the real the real answer is sort of worse than that. She says this stuff because she believes it. Let me ask Gary Mond about this. Gary, um, do you think that Suella Braverman is doing what Hugo suggested that some people think she's doing, which is saying the things that the greater majority or the far right of the Conservative Party or a great deal of the population really think? Is she speaking for you when she talks about the police having double standards? I think she, to, to a considerable extent she is. And there is a lot of support among grassroots, particularly in the Jewish community, for what she is saying and her viewpoint. We actually had a meeting with her um, about 10 days ago, a number of the senior figures in the Jewish community, and she listened to what we had to say. And I think that her comments and uh, what, what, what she clearly believes in, to some extent, reflects what we actually told her. What did you tell her? What did you have to say? I said there's tremendous degree of fear and even terror to, to a considerable extent within the Jewish community about these marches, which are essentially hate fests uh, as far as many are concerned. And, and, and people who would reply, and forgive me for saying it, it seems so obvious in a way, just don't be in the orbit of the marchers and then you won't have to be frightened. It's a very specific route. They're not necessarily spiralling off into neighbouring streets, so Jewish people who don't want to go near the march shouldn't. I'm not saying it is right to say don't walk through the, the city in which you live or any city that you like at any time. Of course I'm not saying that. But the idea of being extremely frightened by a march... I think people listening and watching might think, well, marches don't, go, a, don't go near it then. The marches gain a great deal of publicity, and not just from the people who are on the march, but from all those who watch the march, and particularly many of those who do support the march, even though they're not there. And that feeds into adverse behaviour among many of those who support uh, the, the viewpoint of the marches, and that often leads to anti-Semitism uh, and potentially attacks. There's tremendous fear about violence. We've seen a little of it, it could get a heck of a lot worse. And 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 Suella Ravman has called these marches hate marches. She's right. You say she's right. Yes. Explain why you think that. Because this, the main reason why the marches are marching is not because they're pro-Palestine. It's because they're anti-Israel and, to a considerable extent, anti-Semitic as well. If they were pro-Palestine, they would have marched four or five years ago when Bashar al-Assad of Syria was massacring Palestinians at that time. But, of course, the, the Israel wasn't involved, Jews weren't involved. There were no marches. What, what makes you, when you watch what's going on at the marches, feel that the prevailing emotion and the real sentiment is anti-Semitism, which is racism against Jewish people, which is hatred of Jews? What, what is it that you have seen and heard and witnessed that makes you feel well, that the that is The most obvious the... point is from the river to the sea. The chant of from the river to the sea is essentially a chant in favour of wiping out the state of Israel. There's no doubt about that whatsoever. And, of course, we've also seen those placards with people putting Mug and Dovids into rubbish bins. Yes, those are the um, stars of David, yes. Yeah. And, and, and what about the concept of the pro-Palestine marchers marching for Palestine and for peace, but against Hamas? Have you ever seen that? There is a, a big debate going on as to, to what extent do ordinary Palestinian people actually support Hamas. So many of them over the last 20 years have been indoctrinated as children going on terror training camps where they learn to use AK-47 rifles at the age of five. That they, these days now, that those children who were learning at the age of five 15 years ago are now 20. And I'm afraid a whole generation of young people have grown up in Gaza 
who absolutely have been taught to hate Israel, hate the Jews, and support the Hamas charter, which is to murder every Jew in the world. And, it's, and one thing I would add is that it's, we all, there's been this big debate about whether um, we should, the BBC should use the word terrorist. I don't think that's good enough. They're genocidal terrorists. It's more than that. It's not like the IRA, who didn't never had the plan to murder every single Christian in the United Kingdom. Hamas want to murder every single Jew, and that has to be made crystal clear. All right, let's bring They're Nick Maynard into this. Nick, you, you're a doctor. It's a completely different angle. You're not here for a political purpose. On the other hand, it's quite true that everything has become politicised, whether we want it to be or whether we don't. Maybe we should start by talking about peace and talk about the vigil that you're going to be attending tonight. Y yes, thank you, Vanessa, for asking me on. Um, I approach this from an entirely humanitarian perspective. You're right, we can't take politics out of it but I've been travelling to Gaza for 15 years. I've certainly not witnessed anything of what we've just heard from my fellow guest when I've been in Gaza, having made many friends over the years. Um, there have been hundreds of healthcare workers who have been killed in the last few weeks, um, and we are holding a vigil this evening outside Downing Street and a subsequent press conference in honour of those who've been killed. Um, I, with a team of doctors from Oxford, have arranged this, um, and we have some uh, a variety of speeches going on, but we will also be honouring the name with names and placards of every single healthcare worker who has been killed. And what are you hoping you'll achieve? Obviously, commemorating those you have lost, quite rightly, remembering, quite rightly, but are you hoping that it will have any further purpose? W we hope so, yes. I mean, I've been in contact, and my colleagues have been in contact with friends and colleagues at Shifa Hospital, at Rantizi Hospital, the Children's Hospital in Gaza today. Um, they've both been surrounded by the Israeli Defence Force. There have been patients and healthcare workers shot leaving the hospital. We've had a plea from the director of Shifa Hospital today to be rescued. All their team can be rescued because they fear they are all going to die tonight. So the only way this can be stopped is by a ceasefire. And we are hoping that through this vigil and the other peace marches, that pressure can be put on our government to call for a ceasefire. I mean, you could say the only way this could stop is, is, is if a ceasefire would ensue. But I suppose, Gary, you could also say a ceasefire would happen were Hamas to return the 240 Israeli hostages. That's what they have to do. If they do that, there will be a ceasefire. So really, this possibility that we're all praying for, everybody on every side purports to want, which is nobody else on any side to be killed, of course not, and for peace to reign in the Middle East, isn't it all incumbent on Hamas, if Hamas returned the babies, the children, the old people and everybody else that they took on October the 7th, the Israelis will stop fighting, won't they? Look, everybody wants to see those 240 hostages released. There's no doubt about that. But peace will never reign in the Middle East so long as Hamas continues to exist. Hamas has, has it, everything it does is designed to eradicate Israel and murder Jews. That's its entire modus operandi. It's why it exists. Well, let me bring Hugo back into this. Hugo, this March, it's tomorrow. There's been a great deal said about it, an enormous amount of emotion um, engulfing it. But actually, the marchers say that they're not going to go anywhere near the Senatov, which has now been cordoned off anyway. And even if they wanted to, they couldn't get near it. They said it's a different time of day, not the time of the minute silence. They say many things. However, there remains a clamour among certain sectors of the community to say ban it altogether because, as Gary Mond says, it could just escalate into horrible violence that nobody wants and that there are whole sectors of the community in London in particular are intimidated and feel as if they're kept out of their own city in a way that is completely unacceptable in this country. So I wonder what you think about whether it should go ahead or whether it shouldn't. Look, several things can be true at one time. One thing that's true is that the situation in Gaza is horrific. Another thing that's true is that a lot of, pe a lot of people on these marches are shouting and chanting horrific things that Jews very rightfully find intimidating and horrifying. Uh, and some of them do indeed, indeed, you know, veer towards hate if they are not indeed outright hate, which a lot of them may be. Uh, it's also, uh, for a lot of people, very offensive to have a march like this uh, on Armistice Day itself. And I can well understand why people are upset by that. I think 
not that I can imagine myself doing so, but if I were an organizer of one of these marches, I would I would have cancelled it because it's because it's Armistice Day, because it is a gesture that you ought to do on Armistice Day to cancel a march like that. All that can be true, however, and that doesn't mean that it should be banned. It being banned is something quite different. People can make calls about when they want to march that I wouldn't agree with, that I don't agree with. But banning protest is a hell of a thing. Uh, and the Home Secretary is not banning this protest. She's asking the police to do the job for her, to sort of shut it down without quite banning it. And I think that's just a dangerous situation. We shouldn't be talking up, we shouldn't be talking up tensions when we could be talking down tensions. Right. Um, Gary, do you agree that, that banning um, it is, is, is worse than allowing it to go ahead? I think all marches, not just relating to Israel, should be banned on Armistice Day and Remembrance Sunday. It's out of respect for the Britons who lost their lives in defending the freedoms that we have today. Do you realise that in 1939, Britain was the only one of the three Allied powers who actually declared war on Nazi Germany, uh, whereas the Soviets and the Americans only came in because they were attacked? And the Jewish community in this country have the greatest of respect for those who lost their lives defending British freedoms. And as you know, in synagogues every, every Shabbat, mm. there is a prayer for the royal family. Yeah. Yes, of course I do, absolutely. And the prayer for peace as well. Um, Nick, do you think, I mean, I know you're not political, but you are a human being and you do have a view, obviously. Do you think that this march tomorrow should go ahead? Do you think it's disrespectful and also, you know, potentially some kind of horrible catalyst for violence and hatred, which is what it's purporting not to be and supposed not to be? Uh, well, my whole family is going on the march and I know many people who are planning to do so. Uh -huh. uh, I don't think it's disrespectful, of course. All the people I've spoken to are desperately keen for a peaceful march with no hate whatsoever. And many people going on the march will actually think it's entirely appropriate on a day when they are celebrating the downing of arms and people are calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. So I don't think it's disrespectful. And I know those of my friends and family who are going on this march intend no disrespect at all. But if you look at the footage of the other marches, I don't know if you've attended them or not, but if you see the, the atmosphere, the shouting, the, the, that, you know, the yelling, the kind of uh, intimidating kind of nature, not of everybody, of course, but of some of the marches, does that make you less inclined to be part of well, it? Or, or, or what, what will you do if you happen to be marching next to a faction um, singing or waving banners saying from the river to the sea? Well, I mean, I won't be marching because I'm on call tomorrow in right. Oxford, but I've been on several marches in Oxford. I haven't seen that, although I have seen recordings of that happening. Um, I abhor that sort of behaviour and I sincerely hope it won't happen. But I do know that the vast majority of people are there with peaceful intent, showing no disrespect to... to to, to, to those celebrating the downing of arms all those years right. ago. Let me just finish with Hugo Rivkin. Hugo, what's being suggested to me by, I don't know what you would call them, tittle-tattles or moles in the newsroom, that's all I can say, so they don't have absolute authority but they may have a little insight, is that Rishi Sunak is waiting till after Wednesday's Rwanda verdict to decide whether to fire Suella Braverman or not. Now, I don't know if you give any heft or weight to that suggestion or whether you think think it's pure fiction what do you think uh, i think it's it's perfectly possible i mean look huh. rishi sunak appointed suella bradman she wasn't a different person when he appointed her he sort of knew what he was getting it's it seems like such a long time ago that rishi sunak became prime minister but when he did right from the off lots of people uh, sort of raised their eyebrows in alarm that suella bradman was an integral part of his cabinet remember she'd resigned I can't remember exactly, but sort of several times in the few days beforehand in various different ways. So th there's always been a crunch coming with Suella Braverman and Rishi Sunak, and not even because they disagree politically, just because she says things like this, she does things like this, she causes controversy, she causes fights. So no, I would be very surprised if she's still Home Secretary uh, at, the, at, the next, at the next election, uh, and if she makes it to the end of next week, well, I'd be a bit surprised too. All right, I need to ask you all the same question. Coming up on the programme, I have as my guest, not straight away, but later on in the programme, uh, the ambassador from Lebanon. So I thought I'd ask you each what you would like me to ask him on your behalf. I just thought that might help us out a bit. Hugo, what, what would you have me ask the ambassador from Lebanon, the Lebanese ambassador? Gosh, um, well, I'd, I guess I'd ask him what leverage he has over Hezbollah, um, which I'd imagine isn't a huge amount. 
But uh, I mean, I, I sometimes feel that the, the authorities in Lebanon are, are almost as worried about Hezbollah as the Israelis are. So it'd be I think nice he to might be coming on, on to that. say that. We'll see. I think he might be coming on to express something of that kind. Uh, Gary Mon, what would you ask the ambassador? Broadly, for Lebanon? almost the same question. Yeah. He's got to get Hezbollah under control. In fact, he needs to close down Hezbollah if he can, and he should ask for outside support and outside help to achieve that aim. Hezbollah needs to be eradicated just as much as Hamas needs to be eradicated. But it will be harder, won't it? Because Hezbollah is much be harder. richer and much better. It will armed. be harder. Harder, certainly, but the world needs to get rid of organisations like Hezbollah. And Nick, if you had a message for the Lebanese ambassador, I'm sure you've never been asked that before. <laughs> I'm not always in this position. I thought I'd ask you. What and I'm the you third say? one to be asked. Yeah. Um, uh, how much are you engaging with European countries in the state to have a widespread um, uh, uh, desire to try and get peace out there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you for joining me on the programme. This is what's coming up after the break. Former NatWest boss dame Alison Rose loses out on a massive payout following the Nigel Farage banking row. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Welcome back. The former NatWest boss, Dame Alison Rose, will miss out on around £7.6 million in payouts following the Nigel Farage debanking scandal. Dame Alison, I'm sure you remember, was forced to quit in July after she admitted discussing the future of Mr Farage's account with the private bank Coots, which is owned by NatWest. The banking giant said she's not been considered, and I quote, a good lever 
and will therefore not receive most of the discretionary parts of her pay package. However, she will keep her £2.4 million notice pay and receive a further £850,000 in shares. Joining me now to discuss this, Lydia Preeg, Head of Economics at the New Economics Foundation. Lydia, good to have you on the show. Good afternoon to you. Can you explain to people what it is that Dame Alison Rose did and we should say that Nigel Farage was ridiculed at first for having accused her of having done this and it turned out that he was absolutely right. So what was it that she did? Uh, well, I, th I think there might have been some confusion because I was actually asked on to talk about GDP, I think. Yeah, we're um, definitely going to talk about that. Story. I think we thought we'd talk about this first, but if you don't want to, we can move straight on to GDP. Would you rather not talk about Dame Alison Rose? Well, I, I agree with the decision. I, I, I think it, it, you know, the, the decision that NatWest, um, you know, that Coots took with Nigel Farage was the wrong decision. And I think it's right that the, the you know, the people who took that decision, there have been ramifications. Um, but yes, I think um, if we could talk about GDP yeah, and, and the stagnation So what's actually the UK happened, economy, as far as we're concerned, is that the economy has flatlined. And you might need to explain why that is and also what the consequences are for just people trying to keep their heads above water financially, just ordinary people trying to make a living, especially before Christmas. What is the state of the economy? And if there's anything good to say, is it going to translate into real people's lives? Yes, yeah, so the economy has stagnated in the last quarter, so it, it continues its stagnation. And unfortunately, economists expect it to continue to stagnate um, for the foreseeable future. So, for example, the Bank of England is continuing to predict economic stagnation for uh, the whole of next year, for example. So we're starting to really see the effects of um, the inflation, the high inflation that we've had, of the interest rate hikes that we've seen over the past year and a half, um, and also years and years and years of underinvestment um, in things like energy, housing, public services, infrastructure, health. Um, and I think realistically, we're going to need to see a, um, a, a strong increase um, in government spending in those areas if we are to try to turn the tide of this stagnation and com uh, convincingly emerge um, from this period. We heard a tremendous amount about bringing down inflation. We didn't hear much about the word stagnation. Is stagnation what happens when efforts to bring down inflation have somehow been too zealous and they've been too successful and therefore you get stagnation instead, which is equally unattractive and a bad idea? Well, I think it all depends on how you go about bringing down that inflation. So absolutely, if you use a, um, a very broad, quite crude tool like interest rates, um, which affect the whole of the economy, and you put them up very hard and very fast, um, the whole actually purpose behind that is to slow the economy. That's that's what the Bank of England are aiming to do in order to, to bring down demand um, so that that curbs inflation. But there, there are other ways that you can go about tackling inflation. So for example, the government actually has um, a, a, a much more sophisticated nuanced toolkit in the form of things like taxing and spending. And actually you can take heat out of the economy in other ways. Um, so for example, what the government could have been doing throughout the cost of living crisis is doing very targeted support to people who really needed it um, and at the same time um, putting up taxes on those who can afford um, to to shoulder that burden and that would have taken the steam out of the uh, the economy whilst still allowing um, you know those on the lowest incomes to to be able to continue spending and to not fall into destitution. So if stagnation continues what does that mean for the ordinary family? Well it's very difficult to see how we are going to have uh, rising living standards, rising prosperity, um, if we don't have a productive economy. Um, and that obviously translates into lower incomes, the continuing stagnation of incomes, because most people really haven't seen a convincing rise in incomes in about 15 years, if you're adjusting for inflation. Um, so, you know, this is really a long-standing chronic problem that's that's reducing um, the quality of life in the UK, particularly in comparison to um, a lot of other countries. And we really need to invest um, to, to, to get our, ourselves out of this and also to, to make us more resilient to inflationary shocks um, in the future. So, for example, if we were investing more convincingly in, uh, in home green energy, 
um, that would make us less susceptible in the future. So in two years time, in five years time, et cetera, to, um, to volatility in global fossil fuel markets, well, as well as obviously much helping to meet Thank you for joining us and thank you for goals. explaining it. Good to have you on the programme. This is what's coming thank up you. after the break. High and high end northern supermarket chain Booths. It's called the Waitrose of the North, in fact. Ditches self-checkouts and brings back staff instead. Revolutionary. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Back wins? Us. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis? No, I am fans. not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> that's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know, I know. You're probably going to boot me off the show after <laughs> this film. <laughs> Come on, right. Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Welcome back. This is one of the most talked about stories of the day. High-end supermarket chain Booths, if you live up north, you'll know about it. It's called the Waitrose of the North, is removing self-checkouts from almost all its stores in what it says is a response to customer demand. All but two of the 28 stores run by the company, which trades in Northern England, as I said, will now have staffed checkouts. Booths is believed to be the first UK supermarket to move away from using self-service tills, which, as you know, have become increasingly common and you might well say increasingly bothersome in recent years. Joining me now in the studio, retail expert Martin James. Martin, this has been huge, this story. People have gone crazy for it. Uh, well, if ever a story has really tapped into some of the things that drive people mad in the UK... Yeah. It is this one. People hate self-service machines uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous. So this is a very canny move by Booths. I mean, 
self-service machines, I believe, were supposed to A, save money on, on staff, but B, save time. So you weren't supposed to have to queue for somebody to put your stuff through. You could just do it yourself and you could do it quickly and it would just be a fantastic kind of time and motion poem of joy and everybody would love it. <laughs> so explain to me why it's all gone so terribly wrong and why they're so hated, those machines. I have five words for you, Vanessa. Yeah, I know what you're going to say. Unexpected item in bagging area. I know. What uh, is that about? Absolutely. It drives people at the low level swearing you hear at the machines yes. but also you know they get increasingly worse now for example my local Sainsbury's mm. has just made even smaller self-checkouts so you have to do this weird kind of Jenga thing balancing your shopping onto the the area where it's weighing everything you can't put bags on there but also in you know to make some serious points mm -hmm. um, there are accessibility issues people with disabilities older people, um, people who might need more support are finding them very difficult to use. And of course, the irony is, as anyone who's used one recently will know, you still need people to come and deal with the flashing red Every lights. Every second, though. It's not just occasion, it's all the time. There needs to be almost one human per machine hovering permanently over it to come and rectify whatever, you know, the beeps and the clanks and when it goes wrong, an unexpected item in the bag area <laughs> and, and the thing about the bags and people who don't quite know how to work it, people who do know and are furious, fights breaking out, and also, of course, an inordinate amount of shoplifting because people sometimes seem to think that if they're checking it out themselves, they'll definitely pay for the chicken, but they won't pay for a bag of sweets to go with it and a couple of uh, cold drinks, and they'll just, you know, siphon those into the bag. And you do, if you happen to bother to lean over and have a look what anyone else is doing, you do see that happening. Yes, absolutely. There is no doubt all of the retail surveys have shown that actually it's these particular automated tills that are the reason for the bulk of shoplifting and, and how people get away with it. Yes. Now, what Booths are doing is very, very craftily latching on to that public feeling. And actually, I, I suspect realistically, you and I have talked about this quite a bit over the years, yeah. that ultimately we're going to see more humans coming back into the workplace. There's a real pushback against AI and impersonal service. Mm. And actually, we need to have people to actually talk to when things go wrong. So they've got very much ahead of the curve. And for once, I would hope that the other supermarkets will recognise that this is a popular trend and follow suit. I would love to know which genius at Booth's came up with this, wouldn't you? Was it somebody in the boardroom? Was it a marketing expert? Was it somebody who actually works on the till, saying my life is hell because every single second I have to call over to somebody who's meant to be doing self-service and the whole thing keeps packing up. Every second I'm rushing over and going ping with the whatnot, looking at the thing. And I mean, we've all, we've all witnessed it. We've all been caught up in it. I imagine now, I mean, I've never set foot in booths in my life. I, I wasn't, you know, at one point married to a Mancunian, that's about as close as I got. But <laughs> I, I now feel like driving north, especially to enjoy the experience, because it feels to me as if I would be kind of embraced and loved and would feel looked after at booths in a way that you don't when you're standing there miserably trying to work a machine that doesn't work. Well, I'm a Mancunian, and I can tell you, you always will be when you go to the Northwest anyway. Yeah. But because I'm a Mancunian, I can probably get away with saying this. Um, booths caters for a very particular crowd. It's very expensive. It wow. is the, the away trays of the North. And that crowd tend to be a little bit more vocal about the things that they're unhappy with. Ah. So there is quite a bit of ultimately listening to customers who can vote with their feet. So it's a canny move, mm. but you better believe that this very vocal customer base will have had quite a bit to say about automated checking desks when, in effect, they're paying a little bit more for their goods. Yes, and they want to feel a little bit looked after. So when you say there's a kind of feeling against AI and a kind of kickback and a pushback for actual human beings to be there actually helping you with some kind of idiosyncrasy, some kind of humanity, a bit of unpredictability and a little bit of care and attention, you might say that for lots of us, we have thought that AI's barely got started and is going to be stampeding through, not that there's already a pushback against it. Well, reading the room, there's interesting things going on in other sectors. So, for example, in the energy sector, Ofgem have just brought in new rules, which means you have to be able to contact a company not only by phone, mm -hmm. but also by email. And this was something that many companies were trying to phase out because it was too much work for them. Mm -hmm. Again, Ofcom have just told package delivery companies in the last few months that they need to be accessible. You can't just have a chatbot answering queries. You need to be able to contact them. So it's actually happening across the board. There is a recognition that when things go wrong, and we know that that's the one truism in life, we will need to contact a human being who recognises and understands the problems that we're going through. I'm not a Luddite. I'm all for technology to speed things up and make yes, things easier. Yes, if it works. Yes, but not one or the other. And I think there's an argument for having an automated checkout desk or two if you really want to use mm -hmm. them. 
But ultimately, this is about customer service and keeping customers loyal. OK, how long till the greater bulk of supermarkets that are offering greater value than booze, although not meant necessarily the same service, but how long till they think, ah, oh, OK, because there's such a stampede of goodwill towards booze that booze is really cashing in, we better do the same kind of thing and it goes filtering through? I think we're going to see a half and half thing in the next six months. One of the supermarkets will trial in a couple of its shops a half and half version. If that works and they go for it, all of the other ones will fall into line. So I would say to all of the people watching, now really is the time to vote with your feet and go to a supermarket that cares about you. OK, I'm going to ask you as the retail expert <laughs> your take on the various Christmas ads that we've all now seen. Have you seen them for yourself yet? I have indeed, yes. I've been working thought you, the way thought through Thought you them. would, thought you would. <laughs> what do you reckon? So I love something a little bit different. You know, I'm, I hate sitting around and moaning about things. And I have to say, I do love the inventiveness of John Lewis. But also as well, I'm a massive fan of the Little Shop of Horrors. Yeah. And so a big kind of... A, the only Venus thing the fly trap that you can it's, love. If only it was singing, I'd be happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got Bocelli singing. Well, yes, I know, but if any could do kind of like Levi Stubbs from the Four Tops, did oh, it in the movie, so I'd be yeah, yeah. thrilled. But then you, someone can always play it over the top. OK, final question. Something we haven't seen for, I think, a very long time, and that's lots of positive, favourable headlines about Marks & Spencer and Marks & Spencer fashion. And for years, we've had experts saying, well, they just have missed the mark, they haven't quite got it, look at Zara, look at Primark, Marks & Spencer doesn't know who it is, it's failing its own kind of, you know, backbone of customers, but it's not really hooking in any others. And now we're seeing a very different kind of press about Marks & Spencer. What has happened? I think it's a mix of two things. I think we have a very terrible British tendency to kick things when they're down. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to point the finger and go, look at this, this is out of date. But if that's what the customers are buying, who is still there, then they have to sell that. But what Marks & Spencer's have done very cannily is they've looked at the market, they've looked at influencers, they've looked at how younger people buy, and they know that people might buy a single statement piece, but they're going to want wardrobe essentials. And it's that cut, that durability, um, and that practicality that Marks & Spencer's have delivered. And that is very, very canny business. And set. is there a particular member of staff or designer or advertising person they've used that has made this happen? I was reading about somebody who had started as a shelf stacker, I believe. Well, they brought up lots of people within the organisation. Again, you know, very craftily, they don't have one kind of overall control of you. Go into Marks and Spencers, you will see different sections. You've got budget, you've got top of the range, all kind of euphemistically worded, all with different teams working on them. Yeah. They're trying a range of things to see what works. And now, finally, they're back in that position where they're doing what they always did best, which is providing the things that we actually Classics, wear. the staples. Exactly, to go alongside the things that you've bought to treat yourself. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you in the studio. Coming up after the break, the final season of The Crown is nearly here. I'll be speaking to a journalist who has already seen it, and there are very few of those. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back. Audiences have been enthralled and divided by royal drama The Crown since it debuted on our screen seven years ago. The first half of the final series will be released next week, unfortunately marking the beginning of the end for the hit show. The latest episodes will portray the fallout from Charles and Diana's divorce and, of course, her tragic death as well. Let's have a look. All one wants is for that girl to find peace. Get out! Mommy, you okay? I'm okay. It's just... It has all been a bit mad recently. is royal historian and author Tessa Dunlop, who's one of only two journalists to have had a sneak preview of the new series. My gosh, what a privileged position you found yourself in. Yes, it was the most extraordinary experience. It was just me and one other, and we were allowed to watch the first four episodes because this final series has been split in two, and there's two different actors for William and two for Harry, and the end of this first four is Diana's death and how that is dealt with. So they're kind of self-contained, if you like. And it was an incredibly intense three or so hours mm. spent with a man considerably younger than me, because halfway through I realised he was in mere nappies, darling, when <laughs> Diana died. Whereas for me, as a daughter of Diana with her Ladybird book onwards, yeah. this was the most seismic moment in my young adult life, I dare. Yeah, well, I remember it very, very clearly. I'm pretty much the same age that she would have been, I think a year, and maybe a year younger than she would have been. And I mean, I remember, you know, waking up to it. It's an yeah. absolute it's devastation. devastation. I took my little girls straight to Kensington Palace with white flowers. Everyone was crying. I was working those days uh, on the big breakfast on the bed and we, mm. we just took a desk and just put it in the road outside Buckingham Palace. Yeah. And we just turned on the cameras live in the morning yeah. and just people just poured towards me, just wanting to yeah. say how devastated they were. I mean, it really was cataclysmic at the time. And one of the things I always thought was that people who said it was a kind of hysteria and it was ridiculous mm. were quite wrong. They just didn't realise how people really felt. Yeah, and also, and what I thought they captured brilliantly in this series was it reminded me of how, at that time, Diana was everywhere. Oh, yes. There was no democratisation in terms of what we receive or watch with streaming and social media. She was front and centre in all the newses, in all the newsstands, in every newspaper, in every magazine. So, of course, when she died, it literally felt like we were in free fall. Yes, it was absolutely shocking. And, really, and, and people really felt shocking. they knew her. Lots yes. of people had seen her at things. Lots of people felt that had they met her, she'd have been their best friend. Yes. People felt very sorry for her. People felt inspired by her because she was gorgeous and glamorous and beautiful and a lovely mother. I mean, everything was just so everything. huge. So tell me about the programme itself and how it feels watching the recreation of those well, days. Well, what's interesting is we know the story. Yeah. And yet still, and to my surprise, because I'm not a sentimentalist, I did find myself in floods of tears in the final episode of this first four block. I found several takeaways that I was impressed with because we know it's hugely sensitive. People have very strong feelings about the royal family and this series. I wonder almost secretly if Peter Morgan isn't going for a gong because he somehow managed to come away from the depiction of that really painful period, both creating a Charles we sympathised with mm. and a Diana we loved. And I thought that was very gifted directing and I also felt much more comfortable this series with Elizabeth Debicki and Dominic West playing the respective key protagonists. I think it's almost I've got used to them yeah. you know when you're first adjusting your eye thinking that's not the right and but, but and now I'm comfortable and actually I felt a bit like Diana came into herself in her 30s so did Debicki she is amazing and just brilliant costumes, the backdrop of Saint-Tropez, this extraordinary love affair, the tension. But you know, one of the really big takeaways for me, Vanessa, was the bonkers world those boys grew up in. It is a miracle they are as normal as they are, to Give be Give me honest. an example. What did you see well, that was, was bonkers? Just being shuttled in private jets, to private yachts in Saint-Tropez, then returning to stay randomly with a, a nanny before being shoved up 
two icy Balmoral, one line, I'm not meant to give granular to detail less, but I'm sure they won't mind, where Diana goes, oh, Scotland, full of dead animals and rain, or some such, yeah. you know, and, and the juxtaposition of the two worlds, the sort of ebullient, over-the-top colour and craziness of Dodie Fayed and his moccasins and, and, and what might come, and the press, of course, preying on it all, and then tucked away in Balmoral with stags. And, 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 and how did you feel about, because obviously we feel very differently watching something we don't remember, something yeah. that was history that didn't really apply to us, that we'd heard of, and you watch it and it's a bit like a costume drama, even though the people are real, you still watch it through a sort of veil of mists of time and everything else. But when it's people that we remember and we remember it, and also her children, are still alive to watch it, of yeah. course. Her ex-husband, her brother, her sisters, you know, her, her grandchildren. I mean, everybody's around to see this. Did you did you feel at all that it's too soon? I didn't because the story's so well known. But the other gift for this series is that we don't actually know what happened between Diana and Dodie. So you therefore are well aware that the directors entered into a fantasy realm. And you so were well aware. I was, Lots of people I watching think will think people. it's a historical documentary no, as they people. have all the way through. Let me ask you about the ghost, because we've yeah. heard lots of publicity about that there is the ghost of Diana. Yeah. Is that what it's like, an actual ghost? Yeah, she, she comes back and she has a chat with Charles and with How her late about majesty, that? the Queen. It, I mean, she wasn't sort of faded. It was, it, it, there, there was one actor talking to another actress. I was so wrapped up in my own... The, my, the own the part that I played at that time, consuming the press, and my own culpability, our own culpability. Why are we culpable? Because we all devoured her. We, we devoured yeah, her we narrative. Didn't, we didn't contribute to her dying in a car crash in no, Paris. No, We're not culpable. No, but we didn't. But the crazy juggernaut, the world we expected them to live in and to live normally in, it was a lot of pressure for I think them. some of the time it was, and some of the time she was just getting her hair done and going to the gym and having a biscuit like everybody else. But, but you could argue for the boys as children, and I think that was the other thing. Harry is a very faint presence in this first four episodes. And what you take away is he, he didn't really have his mum so much. William was much older, was across the narrative. He's a much bigger protagonist. Mm. And it almost helped me make sense of the kind of Sussex stuff that we've had churning out over the last 18 months. This is kind of Harry playing catch up almost. And bizarrely, I know The Crown is a fictionalised drama, but it helped me make sense of why he's almost come late to the party of Greece. So really, you make it sound as if this is a must watch and we should definitely watch uh, well, it Well, I'm biased. Come on, I'm biased. But uh, I, I, it, was, it, was a, it was a morning well worth spending Tessa alone. Tessa Dunlop, thank you so much. Coming up after the break, intense violence in Gaza as Israeli forces continue to battle Hamas terrorists. I'm Vanessa Phelps and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the nimbies, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. there's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? 
Oh, yes, yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog? Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. But I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off to show up to this <laughs> show. <laughs> Kevin, right. Mar- uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing an interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to the show. I'm Vanessa Phelps, and this is what's coming up this hour. Intense violence in Gaza. Israeli forces battle Hamas terrorists as they push deeper into Gaza City, but civilians are left waiting for the daily four-hour military pauses to begin. Meanwhile, the backlash against Braverman continues. The Home Secretary's future hangs in the balance after her controversial claims that the police play favourites with protesters. And are we looking at a bunch of happy campers? The full I'm a Celebrity lineup has been revealed, with Nigel Farage set to head into the jungle, alongside Britney's sister and jockey Frankie Dettori. Give me a ring on 0344 499 1000, email Vanessa Feltz at talk.tv, tweet me at talk.tv, or find me on Instagram at Vanessa Feltz Official. Will Suella Braverman last a week in office? We'll debate that imminently. First, though, let's have the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Vanessa. Good afternoon. London's Met Police say they're going to put more than 2,000 officers on the streets to police this weekend's Armistice and Remembrance Day events. It comes as a political row erupted over comments made by the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, who slated the police for allowing pro-Palestinian demos to go ahead this weekend. Well, there have been calls for the Prime Minister to sack her, but Paul Harris, the editor of the Jewish Telegraph, has told Talk TV Suella is in the right. I would hate to imagine this is so, but uh, I can't disagree with some of what Suella Bravman has been saying. And I think the Jewish community is delighted to have a Home Secretary of this strength behind it, uh, somebody who's unwavering in her support for the community, is right to protest or to, to hold vigils on behalf of Israel and protest about what they're seeing. Meanwhile, counter-terror police are investigating a deep fake video of London's mayor about Remembrance Sunday. Artificial intelligence has been used to create the video falsely claiming Remembrance Sunday should be moved to make room for pro-Palestinian marches. While the mayor's office say it's being circulated by far-right groups. And in the last few hours, police have told Talk TV that the video is being assessed by specialist officers. There have been reports of intense clashes and open fire at Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza. Thousands of people are fleeing following explosions nearby as Israeli soldiers continue moving in. This comes despite Israel agreeing to a daily four-hour pause to allow people to escape. President Joe Biden will hold face-to-face talks with President Xi of China next week in an effort to reduce tensions between the rival superpowers. The US president also expected to warn him not to attempt to meddle in next year's US elections. The meeting will be the first between Biden and Xi for a year. 
the ex-boss of NatWest, Dame Alison Rose, is going to miss out on around £7.6 million in pension payouts after she was forced to quit over the debanking row with Nigel Farage. The bank say she's not been what they call a good lever, but she'll still receive over £3 million worth of pay and former bonus shares. Tom Slater, the editor of Spiked Online, has told Talk TV this decision affects everyone, though. But the thing that concerns me, and I think the reason this has been an issue that's hit home with so many people, is that there are clearly going to be so many cases of people who are being debanked, who do not have their own television show, who do not have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Twitter followers, who aren't going to be able to make as much of a fuss about this. And the number of drivers who reported breakdowns because of potholes has hit a record high. The RAC says there's been a 46% increase compared to this time last year, the highest since records began in 2006. While Howard Cox from Fair Fuel UK has told Talk TV the government needs a long-term plan. What we're seeing here is a long-term uh, lack of a, a proper road user strategic plan. It's never been one. With our cycle of four to five years of parliaments, etc., we need a 20-year plan for roads right across. Well, that's the latest. Now the weather with Isabel Lang. Thank you. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. There will be mostly fine weather this weekend, but there will be some frost and fog to watch out for. Earlier today, mind you, we had some really heavy showers across the south and gusty winds that have slid away southeastwards. And then really for many, it's not been too bad a day with some sunshine, a few showers draped around northern coasts, but they will tend to fade as we head through the latter part of the evening. Still a fair few, though, for Wales, the Manchester area, also running up into northern Scotland. But gradually they will tend to die away and for many it'll be a dry night with patchy cloud and clear spells and quite chilly actually at many places in the countryside getting well down into single figures. And that means when you step out tomorrow, it'll be on the fresh side, that's for sure. A little bit of ground frost around. Most places on Saturday will be fine, though, with some decent sunshine. Really nice day, actually. A lovely autumn day. Quite fresh out there, though, with temperatures getting up to about 6 to 11 Celsius. And as we head through Saturday night, definitely a cold one. Quite a sharp frost, particularly across central and northern areas. Some fog around as well. But it does look as though more western fringes will start to see some rain creeping in. So it does mean it'll be quite wet by the end of Sunday in the west. Further the east quiet and cold. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Many thanks to Zora and Isabel. Let's move straight now to our top story. Intense violence is being reported as Israeli forces continue to battle Hamas terrorists and push deeper into Gaza City. Explosions are being reported at or near a number of hospitals in the north of the Gaza Strip, including a children's hospital with patients and staff trapped inside. Israel is said to begin implementing daily four-hour military pauses in areas of northern Gaza to allow civilians to flee, but as yet there are no signs of a lull in the fighting. Meanwhile, the health ministry in Gaza says the number of Palestinians killed has risen to more than 11,000, with more than 4,500 of those children. Let's go live to Tel Aviv, where we can join our war correspondent, Tom Much. Hello, Tom. Good afternoon to you. I mean, you know, pretty awful tidings emerging from Gaza at the moment as Israel becomes more deeply entrenched in its fight to eradicate Hamas. What can you tell us of what's going on? So we are now well into what is effectively the second phase of the fighting, the first phase that was dominated by that extraordinary air campaign, that one of the uh, most intense air bombardments on any urban area probably since the Second World War. Now this new phase is more focused on the ground fight, 
IDF infantry, armoured vehicles, tanks moving into Gaza, trying to take control of as much of the city as they possibly can. We know that they've effectively encircled it and that they're now pushing deeper and deeper into the city. Now, as you said, there have been reports of fighting, not just airstrikes, but actual ground combat near the Al Shifa hospital. That's fairly in the centre of Gaza City, which suggests that the IDF are making reasonably steady progress. Indeed, what I've at least been hearing from soldiers is that they haven't quite had the uh, fierce resistance that maybe they expected when they began this ground campaign. That's interesting. When you say, Tom, what I've been hearing from soldiers, obviously you're not going to tell me your sources or anything like that, but, but, but tell me kind of what you were expecting that you might hear and then what you did indeed hear instead. So one thing that people were expecting was that actually the Gaza might be slightly better fortified than it has been. So effectively, what soldiers are saying is that a lot of their new technology, for, such as the trophy system, uh, for your viewers, that is basically uh, something that tanks and armoured vehicles that Israel use have that are able to destroy incoming rockets and other munitions before they uh, destroy the vehicle that that those have been uh, working quite well so there was there is as i'm aware only one case of a vehicle being hit by a rocket and it causing serious casualties i believe 11 troops but it seems that that was in the first days of the fighting and there's been no real repeat of that kind of situation and also, I think that they are just making slightly more progress towards key locations. When we talk about the Al Shifa hospital, the IDF claims, and this can't be independently verified, that this is the location effectively, or that underground that is the location of one of Hamas's most important command centers. It appears that the IDF might already be in striking distance of that. Now, commanders were gearing up for a war of possibly months and there are some signs even though it's early days that it could be over quicker than that and 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 you know we we hear a great deal don't we about Hamas using Palestinian people as human shields and people might wonder is that propaganda is it really true can it be verified that Hamas strongholds are deliberately built underneath nurseries underneath hospitals in the sorts of places where civilians at their most vulnerable are gathered in sizable numbers and and I wonder whether your investigations have shown that that is the case and has been shown to be the case. One of the difficulties with that is that we won't really know as journalists until we're allowed more unfettered access actually into Gaza itself. Now, Hamas do not allow any Western journalists in. The Palestinian journalists who are on the ground in Gaza, I'm not saying that they're not doing incredibly brave work, but they are, of course, they have the reporting constraints of being in a society that is controlled by Hamas, which, like a terrorist organization does, has very, very strong clampdowns of any sort of freedom of the press. So that is really, really actually hard to verify. However, in recent days, the IDF have been slowly allowing foreign journalists in on embeds with their military. And we're hoping that in the coming days or weeks, they'll actually be able to take us further into the strip and verify whether these hideouts have been where they say they are in places like the Al Shifa hospital. What we're gathering, Tom, and you'll, you'll be able to substantiate this or not, is that it is so fine-tuned, this operation to eradicate Hamas, if that's the right description of it, that it involves actually the tiny kind of minutiae of going literally room to room, house to house, tunnel to tunnel, building to building, incredibly time-consuming, incredibly detailed, enormously uh, kind of individualised and bespoke this kind of warfare. Is that right? 
Yes, but that isn't necessarily just specific to the IDF. This is how urban campaigns work in general. So, for instance, the Russians, when they moved into a city like Bakhmut or, or Mariupol in Ukraine, they also, I mean, they had slightly different tactics. The, the uh, Israelis use a lot more air power to strike specific targets before they move their ground forces in. Russia instead effectively obliterates the surroundings with artillery, and then their ground troops move in. But that is what, an ur what urban warfare really, really looks like. It's a much grittier, normally much bloodier, much more time intensive, much more resource intensive campaign than a campaign to, say, take more open ground or to surround a city and besiege it and cut it off. And that is what the IDF really believe they have to do here, is conduct one of these house-to-house, room-to-room operations in order to root out Hamas. And we'll see over the next weeks if their strategy is successful. And what of these humanitarian pauses? As far as we're aware, we haven't seen one of these yet. However, we're told they are going to happen. I don't know whether that's going to be daily or hourly or if you have any more information about those. So what has been suggested, and apparently a lot of this has come at the urging of the United States, it's interesting to see that the United States has been slightly changing its rhetoric from effectively giving Israel a free hand in the region to now openly saying, actually, we're concerned about the number of civilian casualties. We're concerned about whether the, an operation that's killing this Thanks, many okay. civilians is proportionate. I believe Anthony Blinken said today that he was worried that too many civilians had been killed. And so what the US has been putting pressure on, one is to let more aid into Gaza from the Rafa crossing through Egypt. And the other is this idea of, I believe it's four hours a day of time during the middle of the day that Palestinian civilians will be able to move from the north of Gaza to the south of Gaza. Now, that's not entirely to safety. The south of Gaza has still been bombed as well, although not to the extent that the Hamas strongholds in the north have been bombed. And if I were to ask you, Tom, of the relevance or the role that Lebanon could play or maybe is playing in this conflict so far, what would you respond so that's a very, very interesting question. The situation in Lebanon is very complicated. Why it's important is because it's the country on the northern border with Israel, and there is Hezbollah. Hezbollah is a militia that has extraordinary influence over politics and society, and also has tens of thousands of very well-trained fighters. Many of them fought in urban warfare in the civil war in Syria, where they fought on the side of Bashar al-Assad against the rebels. They also have an extraordinarily strong rocket arsenal, much of it developed with the help of Iran, and should they choose the, and to open a second front in the north, things could get extraordinarily bloody. Now, it's interesting, actually, that soldiers and commanders that I've spoken with are more worried about the prospect of Hezbollah joining the war than they are about the operation in Gaza, which they do believe will succeed no matter how much time it takes. Now, as of yet, there have been clashes on on the border, artillery and anti-tank rockets being fired from each side. Civilians have been killed on both sides of the border. I believe about 80 soldiers in total between IDF soldiers and Hezbollah militia fighters have been killed. But this is very these are very, very small numbers compared to the fighting in Gaza. So far, the fighting in the north has been more or less contained, and it is also just in the border areas, both of which have mostly been evacuated on the Lebanese and on the Israeli side. But it is a, something that keeps everyone up at night. It keeps Israeli commanders up at night. It keeps many Lebanese people that I've spoken to up at night. And it is also something that worries the United States very much because they know that it could be the trigger point for a wider escalation in the region. Tom much, thank you very much. The reason I asked the question is because joining me now on the programme is the ambassador of Lebanon to the UK, Rami Mortada. Thank you, Your Excellency, for joining me on the programme. And you heard Tom Much, our correspondents, summing up of the situation as far as Lebanon is concerned. And you have a reason for wanting to appear on this programme this afternoon. So maybe you'd be kind enough to explain what that is. 
Thank you for having me. Uh, I think the reason is shared by everyone, which is to uh, um, emphasize that it's time for this uh, appalling uh, conflict to end and to de-escalate, because increasingly the potential for regional uh, spillover is, uh, is, uh, is there. Uh, from our side in, in Lebanon, the Lebanese government is obviously doing its utmost uh, for Lebanon not to be embroiled in this conflict. But the Israeli provocations uh, are becoming uh, more and more intense on our side of the, of the border. Despite the relative self-restraint from the Lebanese side, uh, we've been witnessing sporadic clashes now for, uh, uh, for a month. Uh, we do not want escalation, but at the same time, no country can stand idly when uh, its territories uh, are, are targeted and when, when its citizens are, are killed. Uh, two days ago, the Israelis uh, blatantly targeted a civilian car, uh, killing uh, a grandmother with her, with her three grandchildren. Uh, so civilians are being targeted. In parallel, the level of violence in, in Gaza carries all the risk for a regional spillover, not only towards Lebanon, but I think towards uh, uh, different uh, destinations in the region and, and beyond. We, we're all witnessing the, the passionate protests in different European capitals, uh, including London. So this is a very uh, high intensity and passionate conflict. Uh, uh, so therefore, the, the, the trend should be reversed as soon as, as possible um, before we get May, May, May into I a ask larger you, conflict. When, when you say um, Israeli um, action, which has an impact on us, do you mean us, we, the country of Lebanon, or do you mean Hezbollah? Because isn't Israel responding to attacks, regular sporadic attacks firing from Hezbollah, which is a militant terrorist organisation? What, what is the situation? For people who are not familiar with the politics of Lebanon, and alas, there'll be many of us who aren't, what is the, what is the situation vis-à-vis Hezbollah in Lebanon, why it has such a stronghold there, how the, the, the situation is with government and that organization together. The civilians that are being targeted and the territories are being targeted uh, by the Israelis are Lebanese territories. Uh, they have nothing to do particularly with Hezbollah. Also, Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese uh, uh, fabric and they are somehow uh, represented, represented in the government and in parliament, they have quite popular representation. Of course, they have their modus operandi, uh, but as I said, the Lebanese state is doing its utmost to rein in everyone because we're not interested in, in being embroiled in the, in the conflict. But I think once the level of violence uh, crosses a certain threshold, it's difficult to, uh, to contain the, the spillover uh, effect. Uh, it becomes natural, not only towards Lebanon, but uh, throughout uh, the, the region. Is it true, Ambassador, that is it true that you were hoping or that you wanted to express on this programme a desire to be instrumental, to be some kind of broker of peace, to be some kind of architect of an agreement or an on, to, on some kind of entente cordiale that you, Lebanon, would try to bring about? Is that right? Is that what you're aiming to do or you would want to do? Well, Lebanon has always been a peace-loving country. At the same time, uh, Lebanon has never uh, 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 stand uh, idly when, when its territories were, were occupied. So, yes, we want de-escalation in the region. We want stability in the region. We want to reverse this trend. And we think that the level of violence in, in Gaza is simply worrying. Uh, so we would be ready to do our utmost uh, for uh, de-escalation and for sparing the civilian lives. The, the death toll in, in Gaza among Palestinian uh, civilians is, is appalling. Uh, so ceasefire at the earliest, at, I, I think the most pressing uh, ethical uh, and political imperative is to have a ceasefire because this conflict is leading nowhere uh, would you, and, would you, and immediately would you be able, to Would you be able, Ambassador, to attempt at least to bring your powers of persuasion 
to bear upon Hamas, maybe using your Hezbollah contacts in government, as you've just said, they're embroiled and embedded in the fabric of Lebanon, to say, release the Israeli hostages. There are 240 of them. We don't know how many of them are alive or dead, but to say that obviously a ceasefire is predicated on the release of those hostages, so to try to persuade Hamas to let those people, babies, elderly people, sick people, go home to Israel, and then, of course, a ceasefire will ensue, will it not? Isn't that what you need to do? There are many mediators working on this dossier, and I think if uh, they're given a chance, if, if the, the violence and the atrocities are, are checked and curbed, the Israeli uh, uh, military operation is curbed, I think uh, room for for uh, diplomacy and and good offices will will become more uh, more more uh, uh, credible. Uh, uh, what should be done is to halt the the Israeli military operation, which is leading nowhere except for killing civilians, uh, and start a diplomatic process. And I think then everyone would be would be able to contribute positively to this uh, dynamic. But as long as war mongers are, are taking the decisions in, in Israel, there is no room for good offices and for, and for, uh, and for mediation. Did, did you use the word war mongers? Is that what you just said? Yes, that's what we see in the Israeli behavior. You don't see instead a response to an entirely unprovoked massacre on innocent people. You see war mongers. You don't see that the entire a hideous conflagration of loss and death and wretchedness and misery was caused really by what happened on October the 7th and that was not started by the Israelis and was nothing to do with the Israelis. It was inflicted upon the Israelis. Is that not what you see when you well, call well, Israelis no condones, warmongers? No one condones what happened on October the, well, the, the 7th. How can you, we have how can you describe the Israelis as warmongers though? If they were Sorry? responding, how could you use the word warmongers when they were the responders and the innocent victims of a hideous massacre entirely unprovoked? How can you then call them warmongers for responding to something that was done to them, not by them? Uh, how do you describe killing more than 10,000 Palestinian civilians in, in Gaza? Isn't that warmongering? Well, you would you would have heard the we president of the, you will have heard the president of the United killed. States. You will have heard our Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. You might even have heard our King talk about Israel's right to self-defense after being the victim of that kind of unprovoked attack. You will not hear them use the word warmongers in response to that. So, so let, let, let so let me let me finish this right interview, which I'm very grateful. To you for, for granting me, but by asking, how will how will Lebanon proceed now? What are you going to try to do to help to engender the peace that you would like to see? Well, uh, we are uh, uh, checking in every everyone, and we uh, we are doing our utmost not to be entangled into the the conflict. But uh, but as I said, it needs cooperation from all stakeholders. When the level of violence is what it is in in Gaza. Uh, there is, uh, th there will be a moment where it be becomes very difficult to contain the conflict in its original theater of operation. Notwithstanding our effort, we really are not interested in, 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 in joining the, the war. Uh, we have enough problems in, in Lebanon. Uh, so we really hope that for the, for the violent trend to be, to be reversed. Here, here. And on self Ambassador, defense, thank you very you much indeed me. for giving us your time this afternoon. We appreciate it enormously. Thank you. Coming up after the break, Rishi Sunak is still deciding what to do with his Home Secretary as he calls for her to be fired. And those calls are, no, as calls for her to be fired, not from him though, are growing. I'm Vanessa Feltz, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back. Great to have your company this afternoon. As Rishi Sunak continues to weigh up what to do with his home secretary, the backlash against Suella Braverman shows no sign of easing up. Earlier today, Jeremy Hunt became the most senior minister to distance himself publicly from Braverman after she claimed that the police play favourites with protesters. The Prime Minister has said he has full confidence in her and it's thought a decision on Suella Braverman's future is unlikely to be made before the pro-Palestinian protest march and Armistice Day tomorrow. Joining me now in the studio, political commentator Jonathan Liss. Good to see you, Jonathan, and former advisor to Michael Gove, Charlie Rowley. So this is quite a difficult one to unpick. Everyone thinks there's something going on, but nobody's quite sure what. I'll start with you, Charlie, because after all, you've been in, you know, right at the heart of what's been going on in government, so you know how these things work. So what people don't seem to know, including me, I don't either, is, is Suella Braverman angling to be sacked? Does she want to be? Is she, is she doing this on purpose? B, if she is, why does she want to be? And C, if Rishi Sunak wants to sack her, why hasn't he? Just answer all three of those and we'll be absolutely fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite a yeah, cocktail of questions there. But look, I think look, Suella is very popular with the uh, uh, right wing base of the Tory party. You know, she is someone that is very vocal. She doesn't mince her words. Nope. And that is sometimes... Uh, uh, a question by other colleagues who want to take a bit more of a diplomatic approach. Mm. Um, and so I think there is a, uh, an, a power balance in terms of who uh, do we need to appeal to? Is it uh, to attract more Conservatives? How do you attract more Conservatives to support the Tories, to get those polls back into a more normalised uh, setting? Is yeah. that being tougher in terms of language or, or, or is it not? So I think Suella might say you need a, a Home Secretary, you need someone around the Cabinet table to say it exactly as it is. Um, uh, but uh, we'll have to, to wait and see whether uh, uh, the Prime Minister requires her services. She might say that, time. but does she want to be fired for saying it? She might think one should speak out, she might think so, but if she wants to be fired, why does she want to? Well, how will that advance her cause? Well, I think she might uh, uh, think that if she was to be sacked, um, uh, that would just endear more of her colleagues to her that are on the right because they'll feel that actually she's the only one that's had a voice around the table to to represent their view of what everyone wants to be are. last today uh, and so you know it, it, it could be uh, it could be that but then um, but then but then for what purpose Jonathan list that, that that what that she might then should the Tories lose the election which everyone is predicting they will although we know that the polls sometimes are terribly wrong and so anything could happen in any minute we know that too but if the Tories do lose and it looks as if they might or probably will what does she want to be? Leader of the opposition? Is that what she's going Absolutely. for? Absolutely. Ah. It's, it's incredibly transparent. I don't think that she is a genius strategist. She's been a lousy minister by even by the consensus on the, on the Tory benches. She wants attention. That is why she is ramping up her rhetoric every single week. That's why she wants to be fired. Here's the, the most damning indictment you can say about her. She doesn't actually care if she stays in post or not, because she thinks that she's won either way. If she stays in post, she carries on having power, which is an immense power as Home Secretary, and it should be an immense privilege, by the way, mm. which she is certainly not considering it We should remember be. that she was sacked once, Charlie. Uh, she was, yes. and... Uh, and reinstated and, within how many and, days? And, Three and, or seven, seven or something? Yeah. And, and Rishi brought it back. I mean, I don't think yeah. she would want to try and get herself sacked, because we've also got the Rwanda judgment for the Supreme Court coming up next Wednesday. Well, now, that would be something, a huge success for her. So if, she... it, if it, if it, if mm. the way it goes the way she wants it to, which it might not. One of the things that, that's been suggested to me by those who purport to know, and who knows if they do or not, but is that Rishi Sunak will be waiting to see what happens with the Rwanda judgment before, A, firing her, or B, not firing her, Jonathan. Yes, but of course, this is Rishi Sunak all over. He is a ditherer, he's an incredibly indecisive politician, and with each thing that he does, he just shows up his incompetence and his weakness. Uh, you know, he, the Downing Street says, uh, already said after this um, editorial on Wednesday um, that Brahman hadn't had it cleared by number 10 or that number 10 had requested additions that she hadn't made. Therefore, mm -hmm. she has fallen foul of the Prime Minister's authority. Any Prime Minister, um, you, know, you know, worthy of the name and cognizant of their position and authority would have dispatched her immediately. But now he's just dragging this out for days, weighing up the information without any new facts coming to light. Obviously, there's going to be the Rwanda judgment, but it shouldn't make a material difference because the government line that Rwanda should go ahead is not Brahman. Brahman's policy, it predates Brahman. Yes, I know. It's pretty well, Patel and Boris, isn't it? But I push back on that slightly because you've got to understand what's happening this weekend with pro more protests coming to London, yes. with remembrance services. There's clearly been tensions within the government between the Met, uh, Met Commissioner, uh, Sir Mark Rowley, Suella Brahman and Number 10. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be 
even more destabilising as, as a situation if you were to lose your Home Secretary just a day before those marches and that remembrance service to take place. So to have confidence in the police, to allow those events to take place uh, as normal... Um, well, you know, then to fire on Monday. I mean, her authority is dashed either way, surely. But I, I just think, you know, you know, losing your Home Secretary a day before, 20 extra thousand police officers coming into central London to help police all of those events, I think wouldn't be a okay, good thing. OK, talk to me about this balance of power or this... To help police all of those events, I think wouldn't be a okay, good thing. OK, talk to me about this balance of power or this, you know, uh, paucity of friendship or whatever, lack of symbiosis between... The government, I mean, the, the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary and the, the Chief of Police or the Chief of the Met Police, because obviously what we want and what we think we're voting for is a kind of synergy between all three, so they're working in harmony for the greater good. But what the hell's going on at the moment? Yeah, no, that's a great question, because, you know, the police are obviously operationally independent and, you know, um, it is not for necessarily the Home Secretary, whatever your political persuasion, to come in and start dictating to the mm -hmm. police how you should be uh, policing events. Uh, it is for them to... To, to do their job, what they're highly trained and skilled to do on the ground. But there clearly has been uh, frustration for a number of years over what protests police are maybe taking a tougher approach with versus others. Uh, we've seen a lot uh, on social media, some of the videos that have come out from those uh, pro-Palestinian protests. Uh, I understand those protests. Of course, people do. People, everybody wants peace in that particular region. Mm -hmm. But when you start hearing things and seeing things on social media and the police not acting when there are, is clear hate speech and preach taking place in those protests, yes. then people will question why the police aren't intervening. I think that's what Suella is simply trying to articulate. And so, Jonathan, what are you seeing here in terms of balance of power, in terms of what, who, who wants to do what and how this is appearing? And not only that, but how it might translate tomorrow when the march does take place. Well, here's a, here's a really shocking thing, Vanessa and this should shock everybody, that I think that there is a strand of thinking within Bravman's team that actually wants there to be disorder so she can be vindicated. Um, she is such a divisive. Wow. She's Gosh, such, that's, that's it's, and it's not, I'm not the only person, and a dangerous I'm, not, one. I'm not the only person saying it. Right. There are a lot of people speculating that she's ramping up the rhetoric. We've even seen today um, a group, I think some footballers, some, I can't remember what it's called, something footballers who put out a statement following Bravman's editorial saying, they are going to come to London this weekend to peacefully deter... Um, yes, to, to protect to, the Senate off. To, that's to protect the Senate off, yes. that's what they're saying. Obviously, they're claiming that they're entirely peaceful. But clearly, this is a group that is um, organising itself in, in response to the Home Secretary whipping up fear and division about what may or may not take place. Well, they would say they're just responding to what they've seen on social media, which mm. are clearly totally unacceptable, either flags or uh, or chants or anything like that. And they feel as though maybe they've got to do that because mm. there hasn't been that uh, connectivity between the police, uh, the uh, the Home Secretary and what the government wants to. But, you know, people will make their own choices as to what they, they do, but it won't just necessarily be on the but back the, of what The, the fundamental say. point is that if you want to ensure, uh, obviously, as we all do, you want to ensure peaceful demonstrations and you want to ensure that the police um, have the sufficient morale and sort of capacity to do their jobs, the last and worst thing you could possibly do is to write an editorial in the paper of record as the Home Secretary publicly casting aspersions on the um, objectivity and the operational um, sort of independence of the police. That is going to demoralise and discourage um, police officers who are sort of putting their, you know, their, their safety on the line in, in many of these cases. Obviously, I'm a big critic of the police in many ways, but they do have an important job to do. It, is, it makes absolutely no sense. It is unprecedented for the Home Secretary to attack um, the police and impugn them in this way. It makes no sense to anybody. But I think you're, you're absolutely right. The men and women that put on those uniforms to protect us all are, 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 are hugely you know, valuable. But I think there'll be other police officers that actually are saying, thank God that the Home Secretary has given us the cover where we might not have had it before to now go and uh, arrest people where there's been too much bureaucracy, where there might be too much challenge over to whether you should approach someone because of something that they've said and does that actually sort of stack up to, you know, is that hate, is it not, or we've just got to get the CPS in to sort of qualify before we go in and arrest them. You know, the, the Home Secretary has given the police, who are going to be on the ground, complete cover now to go and arrest the well, people. The police that don't have advocating. complete cover, Charlie, do they? The police always have to operate within the rules and the police always have to balance out certain objectives about whether it's, you know, obviously if you, they see something that's objectionable, does it it fall you know, above the criminal threshold? Um, would it inflame tensions to intervene? The police have been doing this from time immemorial. It's not suddenly now the Bravmans you know, said, well, you don't seem to care much about this protest, but you do about that one. The police officer saying, you know what, we actually will police this demonstration. But particularly this weekend, I think the police who are on the ground will know fully well that you know, they can go and intervene if somebody you know, uh, is preaching something not that they, they might. Can, or, that they can, that they should. they exactly. should. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Coming up after the break, Prince Harry's privacy trial against the Daily Mail 
Mayor will go ahead after a ruling from the High Court. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who wins? Us. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for Rishi Sunak? I'm so <laughs> rich. But, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis No, I am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted new. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that almost that like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three of here, Tess. <laughs> but I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after this <laughs> <help. laughs> <laughs> <laughs> Mark. Uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going. To, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. High Court ruled today that the Duke of Sussex can go ahead with legal action against the Daily Mail's publisher over claims that they obtained information about him unlawfully. Prince Harry and a group of six others, including Sir Elton John, alleged that the publisher had bugged cars, listened to phone calls and dishonestly obtained medical and financial information. Associated newspapers who deny all allegations wanted the case to be thrown out, arguing the claims were brought in too late. But this ruling opens the way for a trial. Joining me to tell us more... To TV presenter and royal commentator, Afia Hagen. Good to see you, Afia. Lovely having you on the programme. So this is a turn-up for the books for Prince Harry. It really is a turn-up for the books, and not just for Prince Harry, for Sir and John, for Baroness Doreen Lawrence and everybody else who is involved in this case. Now, we thought perhaps it would be thrown out because of uh, the claims by the newspaper group that they brought this case too late uh, that it was out, out with the statute of limitations and because they brought it uh, October 2022 uh, they said that it would have been too late for them to realize that phone hacking had taken place many years ago and why didn't they bring the claim then but the judge said that you know the case was dealt no hammer blow by the newspaper group saying that and that they can bring this to court and everybody 
involved in this is delighted. They said, we are delighted with the today's decision, which allows our claims over serious criminal activity and gross breaches of privacy by the male titles to proceed to trial. And that was a joint statement from, um, from the claimants. And of course, we do have to say that associated newspapers have said that they've always made it unequivocally clear that, they, that these claims are simply preposterous and we look forward to establishing this in court. They've always denied these claims. There certainly was a certain vagueness about Prince Harry when he was in court, a certain kind of, uh, I don't know, seemed to, seemed to have sort of failure to grapple with what this really meant and the idea of a burden of proof and evidence and much more talk about the feeling that he felt rather than actual experiences when he either was reading these pieces in the paper about him or, as in, it seemed to be the case in many cases, hadn't read them at all and wasn't really even aware of them. Well, absolutely. All these cases are about evidence. What evidence do you have to prove your point? And that's what's going to be the crux of that case. And of course, this upcoming case, which will probably be in court next year. It's all about the evidence. How can you prove that phones were hacked? How can you prove that you illegally obtained information such as medical records. It's all going to be about how this group of people, like I said, which includes Prince Harry, Sir Elton John and Baroness Doreen Lawrence, what evidence do they have from the various lawyers that they've employed? How can you prove that? And that body of evidence that they bring to court in this upcoming trial is going to be absolutely crucial because like you said, it can't just be about the feelings that you know, perhaps one of them or any of the claimants felt when they read a particular story about them, how it felt to them. They have to bring evidence that they can they can prove that their voicemails were hacked. They can prove that their bins were went through or anything else that was done to illegally obtain the information for those articles to go ahead. I fear thank you very much indeed for joining us. Coming up, Rumble in the Jungle. The full I'm a Celebrity lineup has been released. Find out who's heading down under. That is straight after the break. I'm Vanessa Feltz and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online and on your smart speaker.
welcome back from Westminster to Albert Square and even the MasterChef kitchen. The full lineup for this year's I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here has finally been revealed, and fans say this really could be the best one yet. Twelve top names will be heading into the jungle to see if they're brave enough to tackle the stomach churning bush tucker trials ugh, and terrifying challenges. So, who are they? Well, joining me in the studio now is the showbiz editor at The Sun on Sunday, Hannah Hope. She's just been in Australia, sitting on the very set and learning all the backstage detail. Hannah, tell me how you came to be out there and what it was like when you got there. So I have covered the show for several years uh, and I've actually had a tour of the camp. And what's really hard to convey on screen is just how, there's me doing a trial, Yeah, <laughs> is just how hot, sweaty and uncomfortable it is to actually be in the jungle. You can feel yourself getting bitten, you can feel yourself dripping with sweat. So the Celebrities really will be suffering by sitting around there for 24 hours a day. Every time celebrities come back, and I was reading Boy George's comments the other day, they say, oh, I didn't really think it was going to be like that. I didn't assume it would be as horrible as everybody always said, but it is, right? Absolutely. They see the paycheck. They see how it does give your career a little bit of a boost. And they think, oh, it can't be that hard. But actually it is. They all end up losing weight, which is probably one, you know, could be a good thing about, yeah. you know, for some people. They all end up that's starving. You, that's you with a toad on your face. No, or it's, snake. it's several snakes. Oh, my God, I, several I tried snakes. a bush tucker trial. Oh, no. How was it? <laughs> it was horrible, Vanessa. Oh, my God. It was horrible. Um, so, I really, yeah, I start to panic towards the end. Oh, so they all have to... Your neck. Yes. Oh, my God, Hannah. I can't <laughs> That's you. <laughs> yeah. Oh! So uh, this is the sort of trial. So we, so some of the celebrities doing it, we haven't seen. Uh. So I know it is awful. So we've obviously got Nigel Farage. Yes. Going to be doing it. So I'm sure people will be voting Nigel in Lots to try of these. People will think nobody deserves that <laughs> more. A nice snake crawling over his face. They'll love seeing that, won't they? I know. So you've got Nigel Farage. Yeah. You've got the boxer Tony Ballou. Yes. You've got Daniel Harold from EastEnders. Yeah, she's lovely. We love she's her. She's really nice. Yeah. You've got Josie Gibson love from this one, morning. Love my actual friend. I love Absolutely. her. Absolutely. So she'll be lovely because she's so good natured. Absolutely. So she'll just be nice and natural and good natured. I think she could be a contender she for definitely an early could win winner. It. She could win it. Um, you've also got Maiden Chelsea's artist Sam Thompson. Um, th there's Frankie Dettori. Yeah, he's good fun. Really see, he good might win because he's so chirpy. Yeah. He's so hilarious. I've actually interviewed him before and, and he, oh, there's me in the set. Uh, and he's actually um, has got a great sense of humour, yes. great character. And he's naughty. Yeah, he's Very cheeky. naughty, so he might be great. And also what's interesting is these, these celebrities have to sit around for hours and around the camp Fire. And some of my favourite bits of the show is just seeing these interactions yes. between them. Bookers have been quite clever. They've also booked Jamie Lynn Spears. Now, this who could be a killer, couldn't absolutely. it? Absolutely. Britney Spears' sister, who she is constantly feuding with. They've <laughs> actually written books about each other and how they don't get on. So any nuggets of information going on there will be really interesting. Unless she does what Cheryl Kyle did when she went in and everybody thought she'd talk about Gaza because she was <laughs> yes. his wife and she never breathed a single word. She sat there in total <laughs> silence for the entire thing and didn't say anything. So it could be that Jamie Lynn is a right stummer and doesn't say anything about Britney, but she might just love it and she might really give up some good nuggets, wouldn't she? Absolutely. Any information, any detail, even if it's not, like, negative, I think will be really interesting. Yes. Also, I think a lot of people don't like Nigel Farage for his politics, but he is actually very charming clubable. and friendly. He's a clubbable guy. Yes. He's entertaining, tells a good story, loves a drink. Yes. You know, is a sociable kind of a chap, isn't he? So he might be a tremendous addition to the thing. I suppose what the thing that you never quite know before it starts is how are they going to gel with one another you always hope there'll be a spark of romance like peter and jordan or something oh. like that don't you or some huge hatred that will spark up. You're always hoping for something like I that. I do think, and I think Anton Deck, you host the show, they quite like it when the celebrities start to get really grumpy and irritable halfway through the show. And I think they quite enjoy these funny campfire bust-ups. Tony Ballou has said that he's got uh, a bit of an anger management problem. Oh, yeah. So he could have a bit, and he's a boxer. I don't yeah. think he'll attack anyone, <laughs> but I think he has got a bit of a short fuse. So hopefully he'll uh, lose his rag. Fred Siriu, who is oh, on he's first going day. Well, he's he, nice. He's a nice chap. Yes. He he has made some comments previously about not agreeing with Nigel Farage's politics. Ooh. So they may have a little bit of a spat uh, around the campfire. So there's lots to go out here. What about lovely Marvin Humes? <gasps> Marvin Humes is going on. JLS, again. Marvin Humes, husband of Rochelle Humes, lovely chap. I actually can't see him. I've interviewed him loads of times. Mm. I can't see him losing his rag. I think it will just give JLS a bit of a boost. They've just been touring. They've got new music out next year. So this is the really positive thing about the show. Uh, it actually does kind of really boost 
always see celebrities careers. Unless it doesn't. There are always celebs who come out and say, <laughs> ooh, how was I coming over? What did they say about me? What about the bit where... And people say, well, were you in there? We didn't really notice you. You didn't really yes. make much of the edit. That's there true. are people who just somehow don't register at all on it, aren't there? There is. And also, there's some um, celebrities who lots of people won't have even heard of, like Nella Rose, who is a TikToker. She's got two million followers on TikTok. But, you know, lots of people aged over sort of 35 and above won't have heard of her. But ha she might have a lot of fans voting. Hannah, I've got newfound respect for you, having <laughs> seen those snakes on your face. My God. Very sadly, we've come to the end of the show now. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please do join me again. It's four o'clock on Monday. Look forward to seeing you then. Up next, the talk. Have a wonderful weekend. I'm wishing you lots of love. Very good evening. Good night. Bye-bye. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, Spanish. you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, 